Okay, hello and uh, hello and welcome to the ninth common session of Sunoikis Digital Classics 2018. This is the last session of our spring semester, even if technically spring is starting now, but this year we have a spring semester, which is ending today, this is the first part, and then we will have a summer semester starting in three weeks on April 12. We always have our common sessions on Thursday at 5 uh, p.m. And today we have the second session about uh, Python. Last week we had uh, the first session, Python 1 for name entities, and today we have Python 2 for part of speech tagging and lepatization. And today, uh, Gabriel Bodar is not with us because he's busy with a workshop in Heidelberg, so unfortunately he can't be with us, but we say hi, Gabby, so uh, maybe he will be able to watch the video later. And uh, today we have uh, two guests, uh, Barbara McGillivray from the Alan Turing Institute and the University of Cambridge, and Matteo Romanello from the Col Polytechnique Federal de Lausanne. So <laughs> I could pronounce everything. So both Barbara and Matteo uh, joined Sunoikesis last year and before. So uh, thank you both because you have been contributing a lot to, uh, to Sunoikesis. So really, uh, thank you so much. And so today they will talk about, so we go on with um, Python and the topic today is part of speech tagging and lemmatization. So Barbara and Matteo, welcome. And thank you again. I think that Barbara is starting. Okay, excellent. And Barbara, you only have to unmute you because I can't. Okay, excellent. Great, thank you very much, Monica. And um, so I'm going to start with uh, a bit of a theoretical introduction and then Matteo will show you the exciting uh, part with Python code to do lemmatization part of speech tagging. Uh, so I'm going to share my uh, share my screen actually. Um, I've not done this on Google so, Hangout. So you have to uh, click on the green icon on the left, right. the bar on the left, and you should uh, click on the share. Okay, excellent. Yes, perfect. Great. Okay, so um, as I said, uh, this is Python 2, uh, Path of Speech Tagging and Limitization. So I will cover three main topics, uh, just a few words um, about um computational morphology and then um automatic morphological analysis and annotation and then i will uh, talk about part of speech tagging and lemmatization for latin and ancient greek so um what is computational morphology um so it's a subfield of computational linguistics and it aims at teaching computers how to morphologically process natural languages um, so the idea is that um, we have natural language data and we want uh, to be able to automatically um, analyze the morphology in particular. And this is a, an important step um, and the basis for uh, further processing, uh, for example, syntactic and semantic processing. And it's particularly important for morphologically rich languages like Latin and ancient Greek. In uh, typically in natural language processing and computational linguistics uh, research, a lot of work is done on modern languages, particularly English, where morphological features are not very rich. Um, and in, in the case in, of ancient languages, this becomes a very, a very crucial uh, step. This is an overview of uh, different levels of linguistic analysis. Uh, it's uh, it's not a normative view, but it's one way to uh, visualize uh, the process of adding linguistic information to our text. So we can start we start with tokenizing the text, identifying the units um, or tokens. Um, in common words, these are these would be the, the the words to some extent, and then we add lemma information. So we reduce the the forms to the dictionary form. Then we do morphological tagging, part of speech tagging, and then we can go on to syntactic parsing, semantic parsing, and, and further tasks like information extraction, pragmatic analysis. So you can see the core 
and uh, the central uh, role played by uh, morphological uh, analysis. Um, now, I've talked about morph morphological um, computational morphology, but I will distinguish between two concepts, analysis and annotation. So, um, I'll, we talked about uh, lemmatization, perhaps speech tagging, so I'll just say what, what they are. And so, um, lemmatization is the task of transforming a word form into its canonical form or dictionary form or lemma, in other words. So, for example, in English, if I have a, set, a form like these, that could be that can be reduced to the lemma this. If I have the different verb forms um, of the verb support, like support, supporting, etc., they can all be reduced to the lemma support. Now, as I said, for English, this is uh, a task that is the number of different inflectional forms for a lemma is is uh, much more limited than for Latin and ancient Greek. So you can imagine uh, the scale uh, of uh, lemmatization for um, ancient languages. And when it comes to bad speech tagging, this is what we mean. We mean the task of assigning um, a part of speech to each word form. So a part of speech is a label that uh, categorizes word forms into different classes. So we have um, open classes and closed classes. So um, nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, uh, interjections, proper nouns are all open classes because they can um, receive members um, without any limit. So we can always create a new noun uh, or a new verb. We can always produce um, these classes, whereas uh, Classes like prepositions, pr pronouns, determiners, auxiliary and copula verbs, particles, conjunctions, uh, conjunctions, numerals. They're closed classes. I mean, of course, numerals can go on <laughs> to infinity, but um, these are grammatical classes that have a limited number of, of elements. Um, so it's it's just useful to have to have this distinction. So part of speech tagging means associating a word form, for example. Uh, rose to its um, part of speech tag in, could be noun. Now, this is not a straightforward task because language is full of ambiguities. If you take the English uh, sentence, time flies like an arrow, for example, a typical um, example that is used in these contexts. Um, time um, can mean, sorry, time here um, could be an attribute of the noun flies. So it's a special type of flies, um, or uh, it could be uh, flies could be a verb. So uh, this is a particularly tricky case where both interpretations are possible. Um, but it, fortunately, in language, the context helps uh, decide the correct interpretation. So now that I've, uh, I've given you the definition of lemmatization part of speech tagging. This is an example of the level of detail we can get at um, with uh, morphological information. So with combining lemma and part of speech tags and, and more granular tags. Um, so normally by part of speech tags, we mean just noun, verb, etc. But I said um, morphologically rich languages, we want to incorporate, in, incorporate um, more detailed information. So, for example, in a, in the case of a of a noun, we will want to know the gender, the case, and the number. Or for a um, for a verb, uh, we want to know the mood, the voice, the tense, in addition to the number and the person. Uh, so, this um, all these different tags, uh, I will refer to them as as morphological tags. And um, so this is just an example from, from Latin. So in some, some contexts, some people merge the two, more, mm, morphological tags and part of speech tags, and just condense them into uh, the terminology of part of speech tags. In some other people will keep them separate. So uh, just for you to be aware of this uh, terminological uh, point. But what is important to keep in mind is that there is this granular level of, of detail that uh, somehow needs to be accounted for. 
Now, I hinted at the fact that morphological analysis is, is not uh, straightforward, especially in uh, morphologically rich uh, languages. And I just elaborate a little bit on, on why this is the case. Uh, so for languages that have a rich morphology, um, we have typically high inflectional variability. So for every lemma, we have a high number of inflections and forms that um, derive from this lemma. And this leads to what is technically known as data sparseness. So the idea is that um, uh, if you have a lemma, you can have see it realized in a whole variety of different forms in your text. So um, in order to reduce this variability, you, you can carry out part of speech tagging in, in, uh, and lemmatization. So you reduce these forms to their lemma. Um, and, um, and to do that in context, um, you, we need to take into account the uh, what is plausible and what is not plausible. So for example, the, the form rosam could be um, a singular accusative um, noun, or it could be the perfect participle um, uh, singular accusative feminine of a verb. So um, which of the two uh, analyses is the correct one in context uh, will depend on whether we're talking about flowers or whether we're talking about uh, actions. And, uh, and that's the difference between analysis and annotations. Analysis will provide all the different possible analysis of a form, uh, out of context, whereas annotation will disambiguate the analysis in the context. Um, and it's an important distinction because we have um, uh, tools that can perform a an morphological analysis and others that can perform morphological annotation. Um, so it's important to know the different um, analysis of a given form, but it's also important to disambiguate them in context. Um, so if you, say a few words about annotation and how it's performed. Um, we can think of four main ways um, to do annotation. Uh, one is, of course, manually. So you go through every occurrence of your of your uh, words in your con in your text, and you um, I, you analyze and you identify the correct analysis in that given context. This is a highly um, time-consuming task. Um, and labor intensive and it's considered to be the high, the task that gives the highest quality of data although it's not completely error pro, uh, error free um, because humans make mistakes at times but um, it's definitely a good good choice for small amounts of text when we have to deal with large amounts of text then automatic annotation is is a good choice in the sense that we will have uh, computer programs that will do the task for us. Um, and I'll say a few words about how that's done. Um, we can also go for a compromise where uh, we run an automatic annotation first and then we go through the, the uh, results and we manually correct them. And, and that uh, leads to um, higher quality uh, results if we're concerned um, with and um, about the um, accuracy of our automatic annotation. And finally, we can scale up uh, the manual analysis uh, with crowdsourcing by resorting to uh, more or less um, large teams of, of annotators. Um, automatic morphological annotation, as I said, has some advantages in that it's scalable. Also, it ensures consistency in the sense that there is a an algorithm, a computer program that governs the decisions of, of um, the analysis to be chosen in, in the context, um, even though uh, those decisions may not always be correct, it will definitely be consistent. And uh, of course, it, it's a, a less expensive um, approach. Um, um, but of course, it, I mean, it, it, it's not an error-free um, um, approach, um, uh, as we know, and, and the different um, accuracy of, of automatic um, 
approaches to annot morphological annotation will give different level results and and this is an active area of research where people are trying to get better and better, better results um the way um automatic um morphological uh, annotators um annotation tools work is that they they will rely on a, on a corpus so i will say um a little bit um more about about that uh, in a little while, but um, the idea is that uh, we can adapt to some extent. We can adapt to the features of the corpus in question. Uh, so I'll ex let let me explain what I mean. So um, the two main ways of um, automatically annotating a corpus. One is a rule based uh, approach where uh, humans ha um, hand craft some rules, a lot, usually very long list of rules. And so they will say things like, well, if the form ends with um, um, then it could be the accusative singular of a noun of the first declension class, or it could be uh, a verbal form, first person singular, and so on. So um, we would need to account for the exceptions and for the regularities in the language. Um, and then there are statistical uh, approaches or machine learning approaches, which will rely on uh, some training sets. So these would be uh, texts that have been previously uh, annotated, typically by hand, and the tree banks. As, and I, I'm sure you know a lot about tree banks. You've heard a few lectures about tree banks. Um, and uh, they are amazing resources that can be used to train uh, algorithms that can um, learn um, regularities in the in, and identify patterns in the training sets so that they can apply what they've learned on new um, on new uh, texts and and so that's what I meant when I was talking about adapting to the features of the corpus so if the training set is uh, consists of text of a diff, uh, of a given um, um, of a given author or a given era or, or genre, uh, then the algorithm will learn the features of that language to some extent, also depending on how much data we're giving it. And then it will be uh, more likely to perform well on similar texts, whereas it may not perform so well on texts from a very different time period or different genre or, or style. Um, okay, so. So as I said, we've made the distinction between um, lemmatization part of speech tagging and also between uh, morphological analysis and morphological annotation. Um, and I will get into a bit more detail into part of speech tagging and lemmatization for Latin and ancient Greek. Uh, so Matteo will uh, introduce you to uh, ways to perform uh, part of speech tagging and amortization um, using Python. And just to complete the overview, I just want to give you uh, a list of other tools that are not necessarily implemented in Python, but that you can go off and check and uh, check out yourself. Uh, so Words is, is a relatively old tool that has been around for a while. And it has very simple interface and you, you just type um, a word form and it, you will get in return um, the possible analysis of this form. Obviously, it's an out of context analysis. Um, Morpheus is also a, a, another tool that was developed in um, the context of the Persis project and was re implemented in 2013 as Parsley. So, this is the link to the, to the GitHub uh, repository. Um, then, the Proil project uh, in Oslo has they've developed their own Latin morphology um, analysis system. Uh, so they, they've developed the, the, the parallel tree banks that we're all familiar with, and then they have some code for performing morphological analysis. Um, then there is a um, tool called Latmore, uh, developed in, in Munich. And then there's Lek Lenlat, which was uh, built several years ago uh, in Pisa, and then has been recently uh, released again and made available. And it's, it relies on, on large lexicons uh, or lexica and um, again does uh, out of context analysis. And it contains also 
uh, module on derivational morphology. Um, so, uh, also just to give you context to the research that uh, area that uh, this belongs into. Um, so, from Matteo, you will hear about tree tiger um, and tree tiger, um, a way to run tree tiger from uh, from Python. And I just want to uh, give you a list of um, other part of speech tigers that have been. Uh, developed um, specifically for Latin. Ancient Greek has fewer resources, um, unfortunately. But so tree tagger is a general part of speech tagger that was developed uh, in the 90s by Schmidt. Um, and um, it and there are now two versions of tree tagger, um, so tree taggers um, from for, for Latin. Uh, so you can you can uh, check those out. Um, and um, actually, the, I've recently uh, worked on a, on creating a, a version of Tritaga for ancient Greek uh, as well. Uh, TNT is another uh, famous tree tagger, uh, sorry, <laughs> part of speech tagger um, that uh, works based on hidden marker. And uh, and uh, Lapos uh, is 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 another one that uh, you can check. I mean, I, I I will give you the references at the end of these slides. Um, Mate uh, was developed uh, uh, by Bonnet and Nivre and is um, again uh, actually performs both part of speech tagging and dependency parsing. Then there's the Open NLP tagger, um, which um, has, a, has been used for Latin and the Stan, Stanford tagger as well. Um, so the, the, there is a, um, an article that compares the performance of these different taggers for Latin. Um, and um, I, I give the reference at the end of this slide. So if you're interested in more technical details and you want to understand how these different algorithms work, then that's a good place to 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 go to. Uh, so the uh, article that I meant is this Egger et al. Uh, from 2015. Um, and then the these are other references. Uh, these are my two books. This is a um, reference about Lemlat and and so on. So I am done for this part, and I'm handing over to Matteo now. Barbara, thank you very much. And now we have Matteo. Okay, so first <clears throat> I'm new to myself. And then share the screen. Okay. Okay. Now I see your screen. Yes. Great. Okay. Okay, so the uh welcome to the to the practical part of the, of the session so the, the goals are were already anticipated by barbara uh we're gonna have a look at tools and libraries that can be used for part of speech tagging and lemmatization in python and these are mainly uh, cltk so the classical languages uh, toolkit uh which is like nltk the natural languages toolkit but for historical languages well beyond classical languages as ancient Greek and Latin, uh, the tree tiger that uh, Barbara mentioned already, and also um, a bit of Colatinus and the Python library that uh, can be used for, for to call uh, Colatinus. Uh, so it's like a port of Colatinus in Python. Uh, but one of my goals is also to uh, take a peek into what goes on behind the scenes, because, because libraries, uh, can do a lot and can also make uh, our lives uh, substantially easier. But at the same time, uh, it, it especially applies to CLTK. Uh, it does some things um, behind the scenes that may not be transparent to the user. So if we are just, uh, for example, copying and pasting uh, code from the documentation, we might not be aware of things that have been done just when we do import a given package. And I will give you an example of this later. Um, and I also wanted to show that there is actually a growing amount of Python code and libraries that can be used for linguistic annotation on Greek and Latin, ancient Greek and Latin. Um, at the same time, 
At the same time, it takes a bit of bricolage to put all these things together uh, into something that works and that can be used for research. Um, so this uh, notebook is also available. Uh, I'm running it on my local machine. Uh, it's also available uh, not on the wiki, but on the code repository here. Uh, after the session, I will up update uh, with the latest version, which is slightly different. Uh, and you will find it here so that you can try to reproduce it and do the exercise. Uh, actually, one part of the exercise will be install Jupyter and also all the libraries. Uh, and there will be instructions in the wiki in the page for our session about how to do this. So for now, don't worry, you can follow along with my, with my notebook. I have quite a few things installed in this machine, uh, meaning that the process of setting it up on your machine will, will take a bit of time. That's, that's also why it's part of the, of the exercise. Uh, so we start uh, with a few inputs. Uh, these are basic libraries that uh, I will call uh, in the notebook. So you can, you can recognize already CLTK. Uh, this TQDM, um, it's a very simple, does a very simple thing, which is displaying um, a progression bar for tasks that normally take a long time. So you can follow along the progression of your task, uh, which is quite handy, I quite like it. Um, one thing, as you probably know, that you can do with libraries, once you import them, it's to have a look at the version. So you, uh, most, it's like a standard. Most of the libraries encode their version inside, inside um, this property of the library. So you can call it up and, and see which uh, version of the library you're running, which in some cases will be, um, it's useful. Uh, so the, the, thing, the first thing that, you will, that we will have to do is to download some data. Uh, because in CLTK, uh, they have a way of keeping separate the code and the corpora that can be used within the code. Um, and the library itself, CLTK, provides uh, some importers. So for example, this corpus importer that actually do the job of um, downloading from the internet a given version of a corpus and putting it on your machine for you to use it with the CLTK. Uh, so, for example, uh, you first, if you want to do, we want to do it for Greek, so we import uh, the corpus importer um, to which we ask the subset of data for Greek. Uh, and the first thing that you can do with this object, which is the corpus importer, is to output a list of the corpora. And here you see several. Um, those that are relevant for our session are the model, CLTK. Greek model CLTK, I will say something about it later, and um, the Greek text persons, which, as you might have guessed, um, allows you to download the corpus of uh, Perseus TI XML uh, works on your machine. Um, I'm not going to do it now because it's going to take, uh, well, be first because I have it already and because it's going to overwrite uh, what I have, but if you if you execute this line, this cell of the, of the notebook, you will have it on your machine. And the, once you have it on your machine, uh, it will be, I can show you. So another thing that you can do with Jupyter, apart from running the code, uh, you can also um, run a terminal, like a normal terminal on your operating system. Um, and in this case, I can look at the, um, at the folder where CLTK is storing the data, which is which will be in in Unix system inside your personal folder in a directory called CLTK data. So if we start browsing it, you can see there is a, um, a Greek and Latin subfolder, and there is also a um, there is also a log, uh, which to which we can also have a look. Uh, and this is where CLTK keeps track of uh, the operation it does behind the scenes. So when you ask import corpus, this is what is going on and it's being logged somewhere. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to show, if you go to uh, Greek and then text, here you will see uh, the Greek text Perseus with all the, the works divided by authors. Uh, this is what gets downloaded when you execute this set. 
Uh, and the same can be done for Latin, uh, not surprisingly, in a very similar fashion. So you import a corpus importer from Latin, and then you can output what's inside. Uh, then you can uh, download uh, some parts of this corpus, because downloading everything will, will take too long and too much space, and it's not necessary. Um, what we will need for, for our uh, session is the, this training set of sentences and the Latin text library. Let, let in text, let in uh, whilst you downloaded uh, these two things, then you can do uh, an import like this. Um, when you import, where you import from CLTK, Corpus Latin, the Latin library, uh, which creates this object. Uh, and here we can print uh, the type of the object. And the type of the object is a plain test Corpus reader. So it's a utility that CLTK, deriving it from NLTK, provides to read uh, plain text corpora of text. And it provides some nice functionalities. So one functionality, for example, uh, to make, the, which is very handy and makes our lives very easy, um, is to, um, to get all the words for a given word. For example, let's assume we want to, uh, to inspect and, and to work on uh, Kikero's De Amicitia, here, uh, just by calling the words method of the Latin library, we can get uh, and passing it the, the, the place in the, in the file system, the, the path to the, to the file, we can get all the words uh, for this word. So here I execute it, and we know there are slightly over 11,000 words. Um, Another method is um, on, on the corpus reader uh, to get the file IDs. Um, and this gives you, it's actually a method, so I have to call it. Uh, and this gives you all the possible uh, works divided by into, into author subfolders that you can call. Uh, and, and from this, you can derive the information to pass to the words method. So that's quite nice. Um, so to get a certain range of token, tokens, we can use the slice notation. So let's assume I want to get the first 10 words, then I use the semicolon, uh, the colon, and then the number of words that I want to get. So in, in, in return, I get a list of, with the first 10 words of, of this word. Or you can also take uh, the last one, or you can take an arbitrary number, uh, let's say 100, starting from number 10 uh, to 110, and then you can do like this. Uh, where, where the first, the first uh, are not very, very informative. Um, then another thing you can do using the methods of this plain test corpus reader is to count the number of occurrences. So here we can count the occurrences of the et, or count the occurrences of Amikitsa. Only these are just method, methods that the, the, the object provides out of the box. Um, so it provides them out of the box because this, uh, what we actually get back from the Latin library when we ask for the word, it's some kind of clever object. And it's, a, uh, it's a, especially this, this stream back corpus view and this has these methods that we have been calling. Uh, if you want to know more about the, um, what this object does and, and the various methods it has, you can always use the help uh, method uh, in Python, which shows you the documentation that it's within the code. Uh, you can call it by calling help around the object you want to inspect or also you can call it by adding a question mark after the object or the method you want to inspect, and then it opens up as a, as a section of your page. Uh, let's just go back for a second to uh, this operation that we did up here. So here, we very transparently imported this Latin library that makes available a bunch of texts, uh, but this actually does quite a few things in background. Uh, and I wanted actually to show you um, in the source code 
So whenever you import uh, this Latin library, before importing the object, it executes the code in this init.py file. Uh, and the things that it does, as you can see, there are quite a few. Um, it first looks for the folder in your computer where there is the CLTK data. It then creates a word tokenizer for Latin, meaning an object that takes care, which takes care of splitting a string into words or tokens. Then it creates a sentence tokenizer that does the same, but for sentences. So it, it chunks the stream of text into sentences. Um, and then puts all these things together and passes them to what is called a constructor. So the method that constructs an instance of an object. In this case, to the constructor of the plain test corpus reader. As the output of all these operations, what you get is this Latin library object, which then you can call in this very handy way with this uh, shortcut, so to say. But be aware that these are the things that get done in background and on which if you don't like them or if you need to customize them, you can actually operate. So you can change the word tokenizer, you can change the sentence token tokenizer, and you can also do the same for another corpus. Uh, so let's go now to, um, uh, to, the, to, the, to the first uh, hands-on on the, on the part of speech tagging. Um, and starting with the taggers that uh, CLTK provides. Um, so the documentation with also the running examples, um, it's here. And if we take, um, if we take the examples that there is for the part of speech tagging of Latin, um, it's actually this one. So if we copy and paste it um, and run it, this is, this is the output I get, you get. Uh, if you try to do this, uh, well, this was actually supposed, supposed uh, to have failed, uh, but it's not failing because I already downloaded it before the lesson, uh, the, data, um, the data that it needs. But probably the first time uh, you will run this, this code will fail. Uh, why is it failing? Well, the reason is that CLTK relies on some components that are, instead of being generated on the fly, they are read from disk. Um, and as I said before, they are not actually downloaded by default, default but you need to uh, download them if you need them. Um, this reading from disk of objects is actually very common. Uh, these objects that are written on disk are actually called a serialized objects. And there is a library that does this in Python, which is the pickle library, that takes care of reading and writing objects to the disk in this form. So it takes care of doing the serialization. Uh, if you use CLTK, you will mostly not see it because CLTK does it, again, behind the scene. Uh, but when you, uh, when you do this, for example, of um, importing the post, tag, the post tagger for Latin, what this actually does is to go to the disk, look for the pickle, so for the serialized version of a certain object, uh, and then load it. If he doesn't find it, it complains. So this is the, the error that you probably get the first time you execute this. Uh, but we don't get the error, so it's nice. Uh, this is the, just the type of the object that we created. Uh, so what we, so the, the tagger object in CLTK actually uh, provides as methods, as functions, uh, several uh, part of speech taggers which uh, some of which were also mentioned by by barbara is not part of this uh the, this this session to go into the details of each implementation because it's well beyond uh what, what it's feasible in an hour uh but i mean for now it's it's enough to know that uh this is how you call them so uh, if we inspect uh, the tagger object you can see there is all these methods starting with the tag prefix. Uh, each of these provides a different uh, part of speech tagger. And if we call the, fu the function, the method with a question mark, then we also get some information uh, about the method. Sometimes we get a reference to the publication or the method implemented and so on. So the, in, with this, in this example, actually, we can um, show 
side by side the object the, the result of doing the part of speech tag analysis on a certain number of words from the, the amicitia uh, using three different taggers the tnt the engram um one to three back off tagger and the conditional random field tagger provided by the cltk um, if we run this uh, the zip uh function i don't know if you ever used it before but i i use it quite a lot it's to display side by side uh lists of things that usually have the same length and that they are comparable uh so in this case it's displaying um the same token with three analyses the first analysis is the output of uh, tmt the second analysis is the output of this uh, Engram one to three back off, and the and the third one is the um, the output of the CR, CRF part of speech tagger. You can already see some differences. Um, the CRF tagger interprets the ninety one in a different way than the other two, and also the the first two they actually have two different ways of expressing uh, a, a tag. An unknown tag. So the, the first tagger actually outputs a tag uh, EMK, which stands for unknown, uh, and the second one just outputs none. So here you can display them side by side, uh, but actually um, the tags that you get, so these tags, uh, are not very self uh, explicative. And I will say something about, in, about them in a second. Um, what if instead of passing a number of words, we want to get sentences of this word? Because as you as you've seen before, we have tokenized our corpus by sentences. Uh, so what we can do uh, using what, another method of this uh, plain test corpus reader, which is the method sense, is to get back the sentences. So instead of saying the amicitia uh, words, we say we declare a variable called the Amicitia sentences, and we call our Latin library, we call the method sense, passing the, the file name, the file ID of Kikero's the Amicitia. Uh, and what you get is actually a variable where there are stored all the sentences. We can actually take a look and see how many they are, For, uh, slightly over 400 sentences. Um, then you can get sentence number 10, you can get the first ten sentences again using the, um, the 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 slice notation, and as you can see, um, the amicitia sentences as a variable, it's not a simple list, but it's a list of lists, where the first level of lists are sentences, and each list contains a list with tokens. That's a bit complicated, but that's how the data is structured. Um, as I said before. This, uh, these uh, tags that CLTK is outputting are not really self explicative. Um, luckily, there, are, there is code developed by other people, like my colleague, our colleague Francesco Mambrini, who has been working a lot <coughs> on ancient Greek tree banks and had this problem before. And he did uh, in the repository where he published. Uh, some some of these three bank data he also included this three banks.py module uh, that provides a nice a nice class and this class is a morphology class uh, the morph class uh, and one function of this class is actually to read these compressed notations and spell them out um, so if we import uh, we first need to import the model um in this case we get an exception because uh long story short the code is not a library it is not installable as a library but you can tell python to use it as if it were a library by adding the path of your code to the um, uh, to the python path that's what i'm doing with this set so if i do it uh, and then we execute the code it doesn't fail and it actually loads this uh, morph class. Um, so let's assume I have a part of speech tag like this one, which I'm not an expert of. Uh, linguistic annotation doesn't doesn't tell me what it is. 
And let's assume I want to know uh, I want to know what it corresponds to. I can pass it to the constructor of a morph object, um, and then it provides a property uh, called full, which gives you uh, the spelled out version of this tag. Uh, this is what the library promises to do. If we if we run it, um, it fails. The problem is actually that CLTK it's outputting these um, these labels as a uppercase, but Francesco's library is expecting them as lowercase. So if we lowercase them by using the string uh, method lower, built in, in in the string data type of Python, it actually doesn't fail, and it gi gives us the um, the explanation. So it says that the part of speech is a verb. Um, it's a verb, the tense is perfect, the voice is passive, uh, the number is singular, the mood is participle, and so on and so forth. Uh, which, is, which is very useful. It makes our output much easier to read. Um, so let's try now to do the same that we did before using the uh, TNT tagger, but then outputting this spelled out information. So we first run the TNT tagger on the on a bunch of words from the Damikitsia. This is the output you get. Uh, so now what I'm doing, it's a small uh, for cycle where um, I look into this list containing, it's a list of tuples. Uh, and the first tuple, it's the token. The second tuple, it's a part of speech tag outputted by TNT. Uh, I can print it. And if the tag is actually not unknown, because it's not very useful, I ask this uh, morph um, class to give me the spelled out information. So here we can actually comment it out, or maybe we put it in the if, so that we don't get noise. Uh, I can also print the token alongside the explanation. So here we can see, for example, this uh, is a bracket and the part of speech tag is a punctuation. Um, we can also print maybe here. Let's change it a little bit. We print the token, the compressed part of speech tag, and then the spelled out part of speech tag. Uh, so we have a bracket, this is the compressed tag that doesn't tell me anything, and this is the, the, the analysis. And since it's a punctuation, degree, gender, case, blah, 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 they don't apply. Uh, something happens, so there is an error, and the error is uh, a specific abbreviation of this notation is not handled properly by the library. So I'm not going to fix the library now. I want to do the same output, but I want to capture the, this exception. Uh, so the way I can do it is uh, to, to react whenever there is an exception raised. Like in this case, uh, I do the same cycle. This is the, the very same cycle. But whenever there is an exception, instead of failing, I, I tell Python just carry on, uh, but print what happened. So print a message expanded for, for a given tag, not available, and then also print the error. And the output that you get, it's, it's a bit neater. Uh, we can also add a new line to make it even more readable. So you get the tag, the token, and then uh, the part of speech. So punctuation, punctuation, adjective, verb, and so on. In some cases, you get uh, an error, uh, which we might fix later. So, so much for the CLT taggers. Um, let's have a look now how to do the, the letting part of speech tagging using, uh, using tree tagger. Uh, so tree tagger, as Barbara mentioned, it's an external tool. Uh, but there are ways of calling this tool, which actually normally runs in the command line. Uh, there are ways of calling uh, this tool from Python, 
using a so-called Python wrapper, uh, which is a bunch of Python classes and methods that expose the functionalities of tree tagger via Python object and methods, which is quite useful because otherwise uh, I can show you how to call the tree tagger uh, from the command line. So normally I will have to go to the directory, uh, for example, where there is my tree tagger, which is this one. And then if I want to call, actually I did it before, so I have it here. Um, if I want to call the tree tagger for English, um, I need to call the, 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 the binary of the program and then passing, uh, passing the, 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 the bit of text that I want to talk to, um, to part of speech text. So this is a sentence. And then I pass it in this way using this bash notation to the uh, to the part of speech tag. It runs and this is the output. But these Python wrappers allow you to do the same thing with a Python class. And this Python class, uh, it's called tree tagger. Uh, it expects to know where your tree tagger binaries are. And you do this by specifying uh, a variable, a, an environment variable uh, in your system, which, which tells uh, the system where uh, where the, the, the binaries of tree tagger are to be found. In this case, it's not set, so you need to set it. Uh, and I set it to the place where I know that I have installed the tool. So this is actually, you can look at it, and this is telling you where it is. So once I have my uh, tree tagger imported and linked to the binaries, I can create a tree tagger object. Very simple. Um, here I created it, one for Latin. It's important to pass the language because it, uh, tree tagger works for many languages, uh, and we need to tell which one to choose. Uh, so we have a, a Latin tree tagger to which we can pass a string, and then we get back our, our output. So probably to resume, uh, we get back the part of speech analysis, and also in this case, the lemmatization. So in, in the case of tree tagger, tree tagger takes a string, and it does qu quite a few things. So it does a tokenization, the part of speech tagging. Tokenization is the first part. It, it divides the string into tokens. Then it does the part of speech uh, analysis. So this is a, a, a verb. Uh, and it also gives you the lemma. Um, and then we can, in the, in the same way, we can run it on the, our well on a, on any on any number of uh, on the text that we decide to work. Uh, let's have a look now um, for Greek. So for Greek, um, the story is actually very very simple, very similar. Uh, and since we do it, I will do it only only very briefly. So you import the models that CLDK needs for the purpose speech tag. You initialize your, your Greek part of speech tagger, and then you can call it on a sentence. And as we did before, we, you can call different flavors of part of speech tagger, uh, and that's the output you get back. And then we can use Francesco's utility uh, class to expand the part of speech tag. Let's take now a, a small detour on how actually um, do something similar for Greek as we did for Latin. So in Latin, as you remember, uh, for the Latin library, you can import the the, your corpus with this shortcut. So is there a similar way to do this for ancient Greek? And, and the answer is not quite yet, for the following reasons. So the, the data from Perseus comes in TIXML, and what we have, uh, as a, what we have used before is a plain text uh, corpus reader. So we need, before we are able to, to use that, we actually need to prepare the data. And, and to make it even more complicated, the data from Perseus come in beta code, not in Unicode. So in this, which is a different way of encoding uh, characters. Uh, so in this conversion process, we need first to convert from beta code to Unicode. 
and then from and at the same time from XML to uh, plain text. Uh, there were there was some code online by another colleague, New Collis. Uh, this code didn't work any longer because the CLTK library has changed. So I adjusted it uh, and make it and made it work for um, for the the Greek the the Greek uh, corpus of curses. So if you run it, uh, it's actually doing. Uh, it, it will take some minutes, but in these minutes we can also have a look at the, at the rest of the code, so we let it run. And here it's also an excuse for me to show the, the, the QBM library in action that displays this progress bar. And the way to display this progress bar, if you need to use it for other operations that take a long time, is actually to wrap your iteration, so your for cycle, you wrap it using the TQDM function. And this creates out of, out of the box uh, a progress bar that tells you at which point of the steps you are. And especially if you work with a large amount of data, this is very handy because otherwise you have a function running for half an hour and you don't know if you can go and have a coffee or if you have to stay there because the output is going to be very soon. Um, and the, the, the code inside, and you will run it yourself, uh, when you do the exercise, uh, does a few things, as I mentioned. So cycles through the subdirectories of each author, uh, looks for an XML file of the Greek edition, because in, in the corpus there is also uh, English translations and so on. Um, it takes it, does some cleaning of the, of the XML, it converts the beta code into Unicode, and it then writes the the new version the, the plain text version to the file system uh, by um, uh, first finds out the path then it checks if the, rec the directory exists or not and and then finally it writes the output into the um, on, on your disk uh, once we have this uh, then we can do for Greek what uh, we were doing before for Latin. So we can wrap around um, a plain text corpus reader and, and actually create a corpus and put it in this versus Greek variable and then use it in the same handy way as we did for Latin. So to do this, we need, of course, to pass the award tokenizer and a sentence tokenizer. So now I cannot wait. Uh, until the end, so I'm gonna stop the process, but I think this, this doesn't affect us because the data is already there. Um, maybe let's have a look at the um, let's have a look at the output that is generated. So if I go back to my uh, console and then I go to the directory with the CLTK, CLTK data and then I go inside the Greek and then I look into the text. Then I see there are two directories. Before there was only the Greek text process, and but then my code also created a process Unicode folder, and this process Unicode doesn't contain uh, XML but TXT, and we can actually have a look here from the command line uh, to the TXT. And this is, you can see some, some uh, Greek, Greek characters, so it works. Um, so to go back to our creation of the plain text corpus reader, we can wrap all these things together. So we create a word tokenizer, a sentence tokenizer, by getting those that CLTK provides out of the box. Um, then we tell, uh, the corpus reader where to find the data. So they are found in this subdirectory of my CLTK data directory. We pass the word tokenizer and the sentence tokenizer. Uh, we can also react in case there is a problem. So let's try to run it. There was no problem. I get a new variable called process script. And this actually now allows me to do the same thing that I was doing with the Latin library before. 
So I can expect, for example, if you remember uh, the file IDs. These are all my file IDs. So you see S, I lost it, Eskiler, Eskilus, uh, Eskilus, Aristophanes, and so on. Uh, let's assume that I'm interested in the birds by Aristophanes. Uh, I can get the, the words, so that, uh, yeah, the words of, of this word. Let's, let's print it. Uh, maybe just a, a, a little bit. Um, I can pass it to, to a tagger, to the TNT tagger, for example. Um, and in the same way, I can also get the sentences. I can also get the, the sentences in the birds. If you remember by doing the same, but instead of using the words method, I use the sentences method. And then I, I can have a look. I can have a look inside. Uh, for tree tagger, I, I'm really glad that we got it this to work because until like yesterday, there was no ancient Greek tree tagger. So tree tagger, um, if you go to the, to the website, you can actually have a look at the number of languages that are supported. Uh, and this works by um, community contribution. So there are people interested in Mongolian. They train the tree tiger for Mongolian. Then they write to Helmut Schmidt, the author, and he makes available the data. Uh, for ancient Greek, we actually had our very uh, Barbara McGillinger together with Alessandro Vati, uh, using uh, the Proyal and Perseus tree banks to train uh, tree tiger for ancient Greek. And here in the documentation, they provide more information about the tag sets, so the tags that their tree tiger model outputs, and also how they created it, how they evaluated it, and so on. Uh, since it's there on the tree tiger website, we can also call it uh, from our uh, via our wrapper. So in the same way that we did before for Latin, we can now create an ancient Greek tree tiger uh, to which we can pass uh, a bunch of words from the birds. And actually, and here we see the output. And, and an interesting thing, if you compare it to the, uh, to the output for Latin, is that their model doesn't output the, uh, the lemma. Uh, it just output the tokens and the part of speech tag. And this is um, that decision. The, 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 the rationale for the decision is that three tagger, in the case of words that can correspond to more than one lemma, uh, just takes the first one. So it doesn't have a, a sophisticated way of deciding which lemma to take. Uh, and instead of providing a not very accurate lemmatization, they preferred to, to leave it out so as, a, as a decision which is completely understandable. Um, I know that I'm running a, a bit late, but we are, we are almost done. Uh, so the, the other thing that I wanted to show for the, for the lemmatization is um, two things. One, the lemmatization using CLTK, and the other one is the lemmatization using uh, Pico Latinus. Uh, the main difference is that there are actually two different ways of doing lemmatization. So in the case of um, ambiguous uh, tokens, so tokens that can correspond to more words that, co that can correspond to multiple lemmata, uh, Pico Latinus and, and the port in Python, Pico Latinus doesn't take a decision. It shows you what are the possibilities. Whereas uh, in CLTK, they have a way of, uh, they have an algorithm that decides which uh, lemma to assign to the, to the world. So, and this actually, uh, these two different libraries are suitable for different use cases. So the, if you want to do automatic lemmatization, that you, you may want to use uh, CLTK or use Pico Latinus and then help establish your own way to decide for the lemma to choose. Uh, but actually, uh, Pico Latinus is more suitable, for example, for the reader of a digital library or for an annotator to show 
for a given token, what are the possible lemmatizations? Uh, so the, the lemmatization in, for Latin in CLTK, it's probably the part of the library that is the library that is not yet documented in the best way, as it's for the rest. And this is because the actually the, the lemmatizer, the back of lemmatizer in CLTK, uh, it's quite recent. So it was done by Patrick Burns um, as part of his uh, Google of code, uh, yeah, Google summer code, code of summer, I don't remember the, the name, but the, um, uh, yeah, a couple of years ago. Uh, you can read more about the work he has done and how this went into the CLTK library in these two, uh, in these two links that I have uh, put here. But uh, actually, uh, to get it to work, so the first part is to uh, read from, the, from your disk some data that are needed to train the lemmatizer, uh, this back-off lemmatizer. Why is it called lemmatizer back-off? We will see it in a second. So the first thing that we do is to load the training data. Uh, so using the pickle that, as you've seen before, uh, it loads from the memory the pickled um, object containing a list of part of speech tag and lemmatized uh, sentences. And this is used to train uh, a new model that does uh, the new lemmatization. So if we do it, uh, we load all our sentences. Uh, we can have a look at the, at the object that we loaded. Um, so here. Maybe let's have a look at the first 10 sentences. And uh, here they are. This is the, the kind of uh, data that it's loaded. Uh, we import the back of Latin lemmatizer. We instantiate it by passing these sentences as a training data. It's actually pretty fast. And then we can call it uh, with the method lemmatize. Uh, here, for example, I call it on sentence number 10 of the Bianchi pizza. And it fails because I haven't initialized the variable, so I need to read the sentences from the Bianchi pizza, as we have seen before, and now I can happily call my lemmatizer. Uh, it takes a bit of time uh, before you get the output. But we should get it in a second. So it is quite fast to train, but then uh, takes a bit of time to compute. And there is actually a reason, a reason for that. The reason, and maybe I can explain it as we wait for the output, is that um, what, ah, here we have our output. So with a token, which is punctuation, um, and then I don't know. Uh, the lemma for scribble and scribble, the verb. So here you have the output. Actually, the reason why it takes, uh, takes some time is that backoff uh, means that it's running a series of lemmatizers. And each lemmatizer, there will be a certain amount of words that this lemmatizer is not able to lemmatize. And these are left tagged as unknown, and they are passed over to the next lemmatizer. So the number of, uh, so the backoff is essentially a chain of lemmatizers that are executed in a sequence, and the number of words for which the lemmatization is unknown decreases as we run it through more lemmatizers. So that's also why it takes so long. And if we want to know which lemmatizers it, it is using, then we need to look at the code. And here I, I, I reproduce for you the sequence of uh, lemmatizers that are called for each lemmatization. And this is code that unless, this is something that unless you really look into the code, uh, you won't be able as, as, a, as a normal user, perhaps not to experience, to know. So if you use, for example, the back of Latin lemmatizer out of the box from the Latin uh, CLTK, you might ignore the, the details of how it actually works. And also you might ignore the fact that if you're not happy with how, it, how this chain works, 
you can actually redefine it yourself. Uh, that's also the, the beauty of having open source code where you can use, reuse uh, other people's libraries and at the same time also look at the code which is open source, is openly available and see what it does in the background. So I'm, I'm done. I, I almost managed it to do all what I wanted to do. Uh, Monica, do I have time also to, to explain uh, a bit Colatinos, or is better to wrap it up? And uh, yeah, we, we we have four minutes. <laughs> okay, I think I can do it. I can do it in four minutes. Uh, so it's uh, the way the way you import it uh, is actually very similar to what we have been doing so far. So you import a class from a library, the PyColatinos library, and then you uh, instantiate it. Here, don't be scared. There are there are lots of warnings. Uh, these warnings, I think they are due to the fact that the, it's a Python library actually calling uh, some C++ code, and this leads to a bit of complaining, but we can hide it. So the, there was no, no error. The, our uh, PyCore Latinos analyzer was initialized. We have it here, so all went fine. Uh, one peculiarity, so a couple of words about this, this port of Core Latinos. Uh, it, it is, was written, it, it had, yeah, it was developed by uh, Thibault Therese, uh, another member of the Digital Classics uh, community in France. And his, uh, his decision was actually to write, to leave this port as close to the original software as possible. So that the software, Colatinos, is written um, in French, and the output of the lemmatization is also in French. Uh, and he decided to leave it as it is, meaning that if you call uh, PyColatinos, you should at least know a bit of French to be able to understand its output. Uh, so let's have a look at, uh, at an example. So you can either call the dramatization on a single word. So you do it by, by passing uh, to the method lemmatize the word that you want to analyze. So in this case, we pass cogito, and then we have uh, four different outputs. So the, the lemma can either be uh, Kogo or Kogito. And the, the correct answer is actually uh, Kogito. So the first person singular indicative present of Kogito. And, and as you might recall, in the uh, output of the tree tagger, if I'm not mistaken, the lemma was Kogo. So if I'm not mistaken, this is a case where actually it gets not right lemmatization. With, with uh, PyColatinus, you don't get one single result, but you get a list of possibilities. Uh, so here we see the possibilities for a single word. You can do the same for a longer sentence. As you can see, it's pretty fast. Um, and then the information is, uh, is quite readable, uh, still in French. Uh, we can also try to output the list in a, in a you know, slightly more readable um, fashion. So here, for example, we can print uh, one token per line, but not just one token per line, also one lemma for each token. So here you see token number one, cogito, and the four, possibility, the four possible lemmatizations that are returned by uh, PyColatinus. Uh, so that's quite nice, and then you, you can find ways of integrating this into a web interface, uh, into other code, you can do plenty of things. Uh, we can also do the same, uh, also outputting the part of speech tagging, because as you, as you see here, there are tools that do... Position and here, PyColatinus that also outputs the part of speech tag. And yeah, that's it for, for this part. Uh, the exercise will be on Greek lemmatization uh, and it will be explained in the wiki. Okay, Matteo, thank you very much for these very detailed and clear hands on examples. We have a lot of things. So we have a few minutes for questions or for a discussion, maybe. in uh in the hangout we also have francesco mambrini 
So yeah. we can have a discussion among experts, Barbara, Matteo, and Francesco. <laughs> I don't know if you have any questions or comments. Well, if anybody out there is dying to learn, to, to, to uh, out of curiosity to know why my code was failing before, <laughs> it's because I'm pretty sure that it was failing because it it may it met a case of uh, ablative, and my code was meant to just deal with Greek, <laughs> so it didn't know anything about the ablative case. <laughs> but it's it's a nice exercise if any of you want to integrate uh, the morphology of. Uh, of Latin to my to my code, it's a very nice exercise of programming in Python. It's not very difficult. Matteo, yes. No, 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 no. Oh, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry. I just wanted to say that the beauty of having the, the upside of having all the code on GitHub is that if anyone wants to contribute to any of these libraries, uh, can just develop some code, open a pull request to the open source project, and they eventually might integrate it upstream, which is also how uh, Patrick has done this Latin library uh, shortcut. The same, I could do it myself, for example, for the Perseus. So uh, contributing the code that I did for this lesson to the, to the main uh, library. So it's a, it's a very community-driven way of the, you need some developers that, uh, drive the community and coordinate the development, but there is also lots of room for community-driven contributions. Yeah, yeah, in general, this is the spirit. So to share the code so that everyone can contribute, and then this is also the spirit of Synoikis, so <laughs> to discuss together all these things. So I have a, a very simple comment, not technical one, or at least uh, we have seen that, for example, the tree tagger, in the tree tagger we have unknown, if we don't know the lemma, or nothing, if a form corresponds to more than one lemma, if I understand. In Colatinos, we have different possible lemma tasks, so different uh, choices. This, this is a decision, so do we want to pro provide them or not? Well, this is, I think, an open question. Then, of course, we have to see what we can do after. We have been discussing a lot in Sunoikis is how to combine manual and, uh, manual and automatic work because we need both, of course. This is something that we have to learn. So we need uh, to train the machine, we need the pre annotated data, and then after, what can we do? For example, as you know, in Morpheus, we have, and in Perseus, we have a list of possibilities, and there was a, <clears throat> a voting system, so users could vote <laughs> the right. Lemma. So this is a decision, I think. We want to provide the correct lemma, if we can, or if we want just to give, uh, or nothing, or a list of possibilities. I don't know what uh, you think about that, or if there are any comments. Barbara, do you want to say something? Yes, I was going to say. Um, so we, yeah, we, we, um, uh, we had that uh, discussion in, in our team uh, with uh, Alessandro Vatre, who did most of the work for uh, for Tree Tag on, on ancient Greek, um, because um, uh, the, we were advised by actually uh, Helmut Spett, who is responsible for Tree Tag, to um, provide the most frequent lemma. Uh, of all the possible lemmas uh, that the analysis would provide. So, um, so that it's at least the most likely lemma in general. But we decided not to because we didn't want to give the false impression that this was an accurate um, result. Um, and yeah, also because we are aware that the classics, classics community is looking for high quality um, output. And so wouldn't, may not be comfortable with a margin of error that um, the natural language processing community is comfortable with um, for, for many reasons. Um, so, but it's, it's, it's an interesting uh, question. And, and, and that brings us back to the, the distinction I made between an analysis and, and annotation. So Colatinos being more of an analyzer and to tag more of a, an annotator. Um, so yeah, good point. Uh, Matteo, do you want to add something? Uh, no, 
no, no. The, it's, it's, the only thing is very much dependent on the use cases. So if you want to do the use cases automatic annotation, then you might want to go for an annotator uh, that takes a decision for you, and you need to know what is the rationale behind. If you want to have a way of suggesting the user possibilities to, to improve the speed of the, of the work, then you might go for a tool like Python. Like this. It's already quite nice to have now this increasing, you know, expanding ecosystem of libraries and tools, also thanks to individual efforts that can be used for Greek and Latin. So the, the situation is definitely very much different from how it was when I started uh, using Python. And it's, uh, it's getting much better. There is still a bit of bricolage, but it's, uh, it's really improving. And it's exciting to see that. Thank you for your comments on this. And Barbara, yes, of course, um, the problem of accuracy or not. And uh, I understand the perspective of especially of classicists, but I'm learning that we have to show, or at least we have to see the inaccuracy to, to understand how far the machine can go and what we can do. But I totally understand with the classics community, <laughs> this is something not easy and we, st we still have to work a lot. On, on this aspect, but I think it's interesting to see what we get. And uh, but as classicists, we have to learn. And I know because I come from a very traditional background, and so I understand this problem. <laughs> anyway, so now unfortunately uh, our time is over, <laughs> but this was an excellent session. So thank you very much. This was really great. Uh, and um, so as I said at the beginning, this is uh, this was the the last session of this. Uh, first part of our uh, Sunoic is this, uh, spring summer uh, semester because we will start again in three weeks on April uh, 12. So this year we have decided to split this long semester in two different parts because last year we had 23 sessions, which was a uh, <laughs> a lot so now basically we have uh, two semesters in the end we have three semesters and i have to thank you all for contributing to sunoikesis for for joining our sessions for working a lot and today we have seen so thank you barbara thank you matteo because there is a lot of work behind sunoikesis as you can see in our class outlines on GitHub, so not only videos, not only slides, but also a lot of work. So thank you to the community. I want to thank also Gabriel Bodar. Uh, unfortunately, today he was not able to join us because he's in Heidelberg, but uh, he worked a lot for the fall semester and for this new semester. I will share the last semester of Sinoikisis, but I have to thank uh, uh, Gabriel and also Valeria, Simone and Tom and other people who really who have contributing a lot to Sunoi. So, um, thank you. So now I know that now you have to leave, especially people in the UK, because no, maybe for you, no, no, now in Germany is 6.30, it's okay. <laughs> Time for you is 5.30, okay. And in Switzerland is 6.30. Sometimes I'm confused with the time zones. So but anyway, so thank if I, you. If I may, a big thanks also goes to you and Gabby. Well, okay. For the coordination, for pulling things together, which is, as we know, takes a lot of well, time. Yes, so uh, thanks a lot for, for the great work you have been doing. Thank you, thank you. What is rewarding? Because we are building a, a community, so I'm very, very happy. Likewise for me. <laughs> thank you, Barbara, thank you. Okay, so uh, see you in a few weeks with a new semester. Uh, goodbye, have a good night, and thank you again. Ciao, bye-bye. <laughs>